Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, and as always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 96 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you, talking about things that I think are important and deserve your attention. As always, any reactions to the show should be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, which you probably didn't, uh, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be displayed down here somewhere a couple of times during the show. And you'll be able to get the email address from there. If you do email me, please remember to include something like Left Side of the Aisle or your cable show or something like that in the subject line so I know it's not spam. All right, with those traditional introductions out of the way, let's get to it. I'm going to start with uh, a bit of a quick hit of good news. I always like to start with good news when I can. The Illinois State Senate has made what you might consider a love offering. On Valentine's Day, appropriately enough, a bill passed out of the Senate to allow for same-sex marriages in Illinois. The vote was 34 to 21. The measure now goes to the House, uh, where the fight is expected to be tougher. But with the victory in the Senate and the support of Governor Pat Quinn, there is reason for optimism. Slow but steady progress. This is a small step, but small steps are still steps. All right, on from there to something I just decided to do this week just for the heck of it. Uh, A few anniversaries in uh, peace and social justice this week that I just decided I would mention. Uh, The first of these actually comes from World War II. Uh, After Nazi Germany uh, conquered Norway, there was a plan to use Norway as sort of a a laboratory for spreading Nazism in conquered lands. In the autumn of 1941, Vidkun Quisling, the puppet prime minister who gave us a new word for traitor, uh, he declared that teachers in the schools must educate students in Nazism and must join a new Nazi-oriented teachers association. Well, there were 14,000 teachers in Norway. On February 20th, 1942, 12,000 of them, on the same day and in the same words, wrote to the Quisling government refusing to join. The government threatened to fire all of them. When that didn't work, they closed the schools. Over a thousand teachers were arrested. 700 were sent to forced labor camps in the Arctic. None of it worked. Quisling's Teachers Association never came into being, and by May of 1942, he was reduced to screaming at a group of teachers, you have ruined everything for me. Uh, Next up, a quick happy note. February 21st, 1975, 38 years ago, former Attorney General John Mitchell, his aide Robert Mardian, and former White House aides H.R. Haldeman and John Ehrlichman were sentenced to between two and a half and eight years in prison for their roles in the Watergate cover-up. They were variously convicted of conspiracy, obstruction of justice, fraud, and perjury. This obviously was back uh, before the days when we preferred to uh, legalize White House criminality after the fact, rather than challenging it. February 22nd, 1974, came the first act of uh, direct action, would be called Civil Disobedience Against Nuclear Power in the United States. Uh, An organic farmer named Sam Lovejoy took some hand tools to a a weather tower for a proposed nuclear power plant in Montague, Massachusetts, and left 349 feet of twisted wreckage behind him. He then went to the police and he turned himself in. His action and subsequent trial galvanized the anti-nuke movement across the United States and actually uh, increased opposition to the plant locally. At his trial, the charge against Lovejoy was dropped on a technicality, which he, uh, which he urged the judge not to do. He wanted a verdict. February 27th, 1973. Uh, that was the date that the occupation of Wounded Knee, South Dakota, by hundreds of Oglala Lakota Sioux and members of the American Indian Movement started. The occupation lasted 71 days. Now, despite the violent nature both of the both of the occupation and of the government siege around it, uh, the occupation did bring the outrages still being still being committed against Native Americans to the attention of a broader public. Some of them for the first time. Finally, and this is actually this is actually for next week because it's February 28th, but I decided I was going to include it. 
Next Wednesday, February 28th, is the 55th anniversary of the founding in 1958 of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament in the United Kingdom. The group CND still exists. They're still advocating for unilateral nuclear disarmament by, by Britain and negotiated nuclear disarmament for the rest of the world. Now, the thing is, the group felt it needed a symbol, for the reasons I mentioned this. Um, so what they did is they took the semaphore sign for N, for nuclear, which you could think of as being like this, and the semaphore sign for D, for disarmament, which you could think of as being like this. They overlapped them, put them in a circle, and got this. Now, I have to say, though, personally, that this is the symbol that I more personally identify with. Uh, the Broken Rifle is and has been for decades the uh, symbol of the War Resisters League. Uh, the WRL was founded in 1923, and so sometime later this year, it's going to be celebrating its 90th anniversary, which actually makes me feel rather old because I remember helping to draft the statement for the 50th anniversary of the War Resisters League. All right, moving on from there to one of our regular weekly features, the Outrage of the Week. Uh, and this is really an outrage of stupidity as much as anything else. Appearing recently on that font of intellectualism, Fox and Friends, Fox business reporter, her name is uh, Shirbani Joshi, she agreed with host Wretched Carlson that the future of solar energy in the United States is dim. And whether that was actually a pun or they're just that unself-aware, I, I, whichever. But anyway, the thing is, asked why Germany is doing so well with nuclear power compared to the U.S., why its solar power industry is doing so well, Joshi knew the answer. This is quoting her. They're a smaller country, and they've got lots of sun, right? They've got lots more sun than we do. The problem is, it's a cloudy day and it's rainy, you're not going to have it. Now, yeah, she said California might get some sun now and again, but here on the East Coast, it's just not going to work. Now, to really understand why this is so outrageous, you've got to know three things. One, Germany is indeed way ahead of the United States in developing solar power. It produces over 21 times more uh, solar power per capita than the U.S., 24 times more power per unit of GDP than the U.S. In the summer of 2012, uh, solar power peaked at 40% in Germany and only 0.5%, one eightieth as much, in the United States. All right, second, because it's a smaller country? What? This is why this was going to be the Clown Award this week originally. I mean, I, I, it's a smaller, I have no idea what that's supposed to mean or by what logic it's being argued. And frankly, neither does she. All right, third, no, Germany does not get more sun than we do. Check out this chart. The U.S. gets far more sun than Germany does. In fact, this chart, basically, it's, it's an indication of, of how much uh, solar energy a given area gets. The bluer it is, the less solar energy over the course of a year, the redder, the more. Notice that Germany, as a nation, is about on a par with Alaska. Almost the entire continental United States plus Hawaii far outstrips Germany. In fact, we actually outstrip famously sunny Spain. So why is Germany doing better then? Because it made a commitment to solar power based on government subsidies and decentralization. 80% of installed solar power in Germany is small scale, it's on rooftops, rather than the huge decentralized plants that the private utilities in the United States prefer. This is so obvious that Joshi herself had to admit it a few days later. Uh, she wrote in the Fox News website, and. Parenthetically, I'll note, she did not go back on Fox & Friends which it's with its much huger audience to make this correction. Oh no, she did it on the website. But anyway, she wrote on the website that the difference between U.S. and Germany, quoting, comes down more to subsidies and political pri priorities and has nothing to do with sunshine. In fact, she even provided in this article a link to an article at Green Tech Media 
and the course of acknowledging that, as the first line in this article said, every energy source in the last 400 years has been subsidized. But stupidity will not be denied. So Joshi immediately turns to dissing solar power on a completely different basis, uh, arguing that it's not a standalone industry because it still needs government support to grow. This right after admitting, remember, that all emerging technologies have gotten subsidies. But now it is true. It is true that the solar industry does get various forms of government support. So um, let's have a look at how much. This is a graph. This is a graph of the average annual subsidies given to fossil fuels, nuclear power, biofuels, and uh, renewables, including solar, over the history of the subsidies for each sort. Now, the lifetimes of these subsidies obviously vary, but these numbers are all adjusted for inflation. This is a level playing field. In a typical average year, fossil fuels have gotten nearly $4.9 billion in federal subsidies per year. Nuclear power, three and a half billion. Biofuels, over a billion. Renewables, 370 million. In a typical year, biofuels get nearly three times the support that renewables do. Nuclear gets 10 times the support. And fossil fuels, exactly the kind we should be cutting down on, gets 13 times the support that renewables do. In fact, you remember that article that Joshi linked to, um, the one that said that all energy sources have been subsidized, the one she linked to right before grousing that nuclear that uh, that that solar power gets subsidies. The second sentence of that same article says, and I'm quoting here, by most metrics, renewable energy sources have received far less in subsidies in their early years than any of these other energy sources. And then to top all this off, she declares that we actually don't need no stinking solar power because we have something much better. Fracking. Fracking, that destructive, water-wasting, water source fouling chemical cocktail to fracture rock that will result in making us even more dependent on exactly the same kind of fossil fuels that we have to use less of. Such stupidity with, uh, with the future of the world at stake really, really, truly is an outrage. Time for a break. Here we are, back again, much to, much to your surprise, I'm sure. Uh, a, a quick, a quick R.I.P., uh, I, I, I'm sure you don't know who this is, I expect. Uh, that's okay. He was much better known in the United Kingdom than he was in the United States. His name is Richard Briers. He was a British actor. He died of emphysema uh, on February 17th at the age of 79. Now, a few people around here might know him as having played the chief caretaker in Paradise Towers, a Sylvester McCoy Doctor Who story. But I remember him more as Tom Good in the British sitcom The Good Life, which was shown in the United States as The Good Neighbors. This is my all-time favorite sitcom, of all, absolute of all time. It revolved around a couple trying to live a self-sufficient lifestyle in an upscale suburb of London. My first wife, Linda, and I used to dream of being the goods. So RIP Richard, and uh, thanks for the dreams. All right, moving on from there to our uh, other regular weekly feature, the Clown Award. The winner of the Big Red Nose this week is Mike Lira, uh, Mike Lira, a member of the Missouri House of Representatives. Now, Missouri is the state that threatens to pass Kansas on the list of states that do the most to embarrass the rest of the country. Last April, the Missouri House of Representative, uh, Representatives rather, actually passed a bill that made it a crime for any federal official to try to enforce any aspect of the Affordable Health Care Act in the state of Missouri. And for the third year in a row, the legislature is debating a bill that would claim the right to nullify, that is basically to ignore, any federal law that the state happened to dislike. And in at least one of those three years, the Missouri House of Representatives passed this. Well, Mike Lira is doing his bit to maintain that level of stupidity. 
Uh, he's introduced a, a bill to make it a felony, punishable by up to four years in prison, uh, for any state legislator, I'm quoting here, to propose a piece of legislation that further restricts the right of an individual to bear arms as set forth under the Second Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, unquote. In other words, he would make it a felony for any legislator to propose a gun control law. Truly, this guy is a, a total clown. By the way, a footnote to this. In the summer of 2007, Missouri repealed a law requiring gun buyers to get a license before purchasing a gun. In 2008, the next year, the gun homicide rate in Missouri went up 34% over the pre over the pre-repeal average. All right, anyway, that leads us right into this week's discussion on guns. Actually, this week I'm going to focus on some positive news on the fact that there is pushback against the gun nuts and that they are no longer the only voices being heard on this. Unfortunately, this comes uh, against the backdrop of yet another multiple shooting, this one in Orange County, California, where a 20-year-old boy named Ali Syed killed a woman in his home, sped off in his parents' car, and went on an hour-long rampage of carjackings and shootings that left two more people dead, two wounded, uh, several more targeted but unhurt, and all this is before um, Syed killed himself. But... Yes, there is pushback against the gun nuts. Both legislators and the public are starting to fight back against our modern murder incorporated. On the federal level, there is some hope for some touch-ups around the edges. Uh, Arizona Senator John McPain in the butt said on Sunday that um, support is coalescing around a bipartisan plan with the centerpiece of the of expansion of um, background checks on gun purchases. On the other hand, prospects for anything substantial, like an assault weapons ban, uh, appear to be, at best, little. Uh, for example, note that in his State of the Union speech, Barack Obama did not call for a renewal of the assault weapons ban to be passed. He said it deserves a vote, which is a way of saying that even getting a floor vote on the measure is going to be a fight. Now, in fact, this kind of thing about, like, the assault weapons ban that was predicted from the start, you may recall that I accuse gun control advocates, both in and out of Congress, of preemptive capitulation, of giving in before the battle even started. And with Harry Macho Man Reed, who is against, against an assault weapons ban, saying he'll only deal with legislation that will pass the House, and uh, do the math. However... Just as it was on the, more on the state level, not the federal level, where the real attacks on sanity occurred, so it is on the state level rather than the federal level where the real pushback is being felt. Out of over 190 gun-related bills that were introduced in state legislatures in the first weeks of 2013, three-fifths of them were to strengthen gun controls. For example, New York has now enacted the toughest gun regulations in the country. The new law has a stricter assault weapons ban. It put limits on high-capacity magazines, requires instant background checks for ammunition sales, and has provisions to keep guns out of the hands of mentally ill people who have made threats. In Maryland... Governor Martin O'Malley has offered proposals, which are now before the legislature, that would include banning assault weapons, limiting the size of magazine, magazines, instituting common sense, what he called common sense lic licensing requirements, which would include mandatory fingerprinting, background checks, and gun safety training, and it would also look to improve mental health services and school safety. In Delaware, uh, Governor Jack Markey and Attorney General Bo Biden have announced a series of measures, including background checks for sales at gun shows and curbs on high-capacity magazines and assault weapons. Legislators in Massachusetts and Connecticut have also spoken about toughening their gun laws. In fact, such proposals are ir uh, even appearing in places where you wouldn't have thought that they would appear, places like Virginia and Colorado. In fact, Colorado, the Colorado House of Representatives on Monday passed a package of gun control bills. 
They were passed by a narrow margin, 34 to 31, but they passed. The bills limit the size of ammunition magazines, require background checks on all gun purchases, including those purchased online, and allow colleges and stadiums to ban carrying concealed firearms. And this actually came after the state Senate had rejected a bill that would allow teachers to carry concealed weapons in schools. Governor John Hickenlooper supports most of those measures. Uh, now, these, these bills that passed the House, they do face another fight in the Senate. But remember, not that long ago, for them to have gotten this far would have been regarded as unthinkable. Even in Missouri, remember Missouri? Even in Missouri, there was pushback against the NRA zombies. There's a bill, one bill in the, in the General Assembly to require that all sales or transfers of arms be done through a licensed gun dealer. Another bill would ban assault weapons and large capacity magazines. Now, admittedly, there is really very little, if any, chance of either of these bills to pass. But the very fact that they exist, the very fact that the gun lovers have to respond to these, that they have to respond to things instead of just pushing forward with their own agenda, that itself is worthy of notice and has meaning. Individuals, too, are moving. The general public is moving. Last month, in rallies in several cities around the country, thousands of people went to Walmart. Petitions with over 300,000 names were presented to Walmart headquarters calling on the corporation to live up to a promise it made years ago to stop selling assault weapons and ammunition at its stores. And even back in Washington, D.C., there is hope. Now, personally, I have to say that in terms of both of improving public safety and reducing the carnage that these kind of weapons uh, produce, more important than banning assault rifles is limiting the size of the magazines. Um, and while the former, banning the assault rifles, is still rather bizarrely regarded as politically toxic, uh, there is, apparently, members of Congress are increasingly open to the idea of banning or limiting the size of the magazines the guns can carry. And even conservatives have to admit that a ban on large magazines is well within the, the, even this Supreme Court's rather expansive notion of gun rights. But, one of the real thing to note, probably this, 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 this is the real thing on this to note. There's a special election in Chicago coming up to fill the seat vacated by uh, former Representative Jesse Jackson Jr., uh, the party primaries are this coming Tuesday, February 26th. Now, it's a heavily Democratic district. The likelihood is whoever wins the Democratic primary is going to win the general election. So, it's worth noting that just nine days before the primary, one of the leading contenders on the Democratic side, State Senator Toy Hutchinson, withdrew from the race after being hit with an ad that went after her for having an A-plus rating with the NRA. And instead of endorsing, endorsing the person who's the, who was the nominal frontrunner, former U.S. Representative Debbie Halverson, who also has an A rating from the NRA, Hutchinson endorsed ex-state representative Robin Kelly, who has been loudly and proudly touting her F rating from the NRA. Uh, I mean, Kelly is the strongest challenger to Halverson. It's now basically a two-person race. It's regarded as a two-person race between Kelly and Halverson. And the fact that Hutchinson endorsed Kelly rather than Halverson tells you a lot about that district. Now, yes, it's Chicago, okay? Yes, uh, Chicago's seen a lot of gun violence, uh, and, uh, and that may have impacted the way people view things. But the fact is, Halverson right now is running away. She's literally running away from her past support from and, uh, uh, and of the NRA. When was the last time you, you found a candidate for federal office in this country who was actively running away from the NRA? Again, it may just be Chicago, it may just be this, but this still has meaning. All right, finally for this week, 
On this, amidst all the uh, past failures and present frustrations, something helps to uh, keep hope alive. A big reason why the NRA, the nutsoid rabbit brains of America, acting on behalf of its paymasters, pay the gun manufacturers, big reason why it's so keen on preventing a new assault weapons ban is that the industry's customer base is shrinking. 30 years ago, about 50% of households had a gun. Now it's less than a third. 30 years ago, about 30% of the population actually owned a firearm. Now it's about 20% do. So the only way for these corporations to keep profits up is to sell more and more expensive weapons to fewer and fewer people. You know, what this says, if this continues, I don't know how long it will take. I don't know how many will die needlessly in that time. But this does indicate that not only truth, but time is also on our side. All right, last thing for this week. We're going to hop over into and another thing, our occasional foray into non-political scientific stuff. Sometime back, I told you that scientists believed that they had found the Higgs boson, which some nicknamed the God particle, because it would answer one of the most basic questions in physics. Why do things have mass? Now, it's still not certain the Higgs has actually been observed, but it does appear that confidence that it has been observed is growing. With that in mind, scientists are starting to consider what this means for the future of the universe. According to theoretical physicist Joseph Lichen, quoting, If you use all the physics that we now know and you do what you think is a straightforward calculation, it's bad news. It may be that the universe we live in is inherently unstable, and at some point years from now, it's all going to get wiped out. That it, what will happen is that a little bubble of what you might think of an alternative universe will just appear and then spread out, destroying everything in its path. Now, which raises an interesting, if likely unanswerable question for me, which is first is, is our universe destroying some other universe in the course of its expansion? Um, but the thing is, I have to tell you, if you're concerned about this, don't be. For one thing, if this bubble happens, it will expand at the speed of light. Since information cannot be transmitted faster than the speed of light, you won't know about this until it happens to you, after which you will not be there to know about it. It's kind of like Bill Cosby saying that his uh, grandfather told him not to worry about getting senile because when it happens to you, you won't know it. The other thing is that when this happens, uh, if it happens, uh, it's gonna, uh, you, don't worry about it. You will be long dead. In fact, so will the Earth. This will be billions of years in the future, a uh, long time after the Earth has been burnt to a crisp by the sun in its death throes. So, yes, you can actually make plans for next week, which is when we will be back and we will see you again. Have the best week you can.